I was both surprised and flattered to be asked to introduce my friend Mickey, who has a real job, to say the least, and has devised, along with his colleagues, real clothes for real people at real prices. His gifts combine the aesthetic and the commercial, and tonight, for his 40 years and counting of innovative and creative work, he's being honored for that. His achievements, you all know, his transformation of Ann Taylor, the Gap, and Banana Republic, his invention of Old Navy and Madewell, his counsel to business innovators as varied as Apple and Warby Parker. He adores his children and his wonderful wife, Peggy, and he also has more worldly pleasures, I'd say. He has got more houses than a game of Monopoly. He's got more Range Rovers than the French Foreign Legion. But he genuinely and completely inhabits his work. He is, without apology, obsessed. Mickey Drexler was born and raised in the Bronx, not in easy circumstances. And that accounts for at least part of his enormous drive to succeed and for the consideration he shows his friends and his colleagues. What makes him a fascinating and wildly successful merchant is his constant anticipation of what people want and a fanatical attention to detail. Every day, he gets on that crazy office loudspeaker and asks his entire office a string of brutal questions about the width of a lapel, the position of a pocket, a new color, some small, some small thing that's the difference between your run-of-the-mill schmata and something that someone actually wants to put on his or her back. Mickey is very much in the midst of his working life, but it's not hard to define the mark he's already made on the American landscape. You might say that he's transformed the dusky shale of American retail with the sweet persimmon of his own vitality. I have no idea what that means. So let me put it a different way. Mickey Drexler has changed in some definable fashion the look of things. He's changed the way much of America has dressed up, and when it feels like it, the way it is dressed down. He is, as they used to say in Mickey's childhood house and in mine, a knocker, a macher, a big shot, a master of his realm. Let's see him in action. You're on, Mickey. Can I have your attention, please? Can I have your attention? The quote of the day, the master has failed more times than the beginner has even tried. Thank you, thank you. It's hard to explain what one does. You try to remain a shopkeeper, as I am. I'm a worker. Wow, wow. I love and need to have contact with the store people. I'm not a person that's sitting behind the desk, not out there walking around, working, asking the questions, and trying to figure out how it gets done a better way. Uh, loudspeaker, please. Yeah. Can I have your attention, please? I'm here at Madewell Fifth. I have a question about the V-neck pocket tee. I'm wondering if it's the shape of that T-shirt that's selling it like crazy, which is what the team is discussing. And it takes a team of people, because you can't do it yourself. Where's Matt, by the way? Tamari's getting married. Email Matt and say, Matt, mazel tov, we miss you. Now he doesn't want to know we miss him. One sec. Martin, now would you like this better? Yeah. I got it. Okay. Okay. I'm lucky because I like what I do. It's action. I need, it's, you know, there's this Yiddish term, spilkus. Ants in your pants, so I have spilkus. My best mentor was a woman named Katie Murphy at Bloomingdale's. I think by virtue of I work with a lot of people, now I look at myself more as a teacher than, than before. Mickey's the best mentor that I've ever had. I believe his success has, has been his ability to be in touch with his own intuition. The curiosity, I think, is, is probably what will keep you young. This is a eulogy, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. This is the captain speaking. I've always lived in my imagination growing up. 
because maybe because my life wasn't what I imagined it to be. Well, Jenna says it interestingly. You grew up in a certain way. You wanted certain things. You couldn't afford most of them. And you decided to do clothes and things that were within the reach of most people. These are the authentic Burrow Boys, my PS76 classmates and best buddies. They were major athletes, but unfortunately, not one of these sports could be done outside of the Bronx and probably Brooklyn. So from that third window to here is where I spent the first part of my life. Mickey was always dressed well. Perfect dress, really. Growing up in the Bronx created this enormous, call it an ambition, I call it more a hunger. I identify more with here in my life than I do with where I am today. But I, I, I have the balance of both. But you can never forget your roots. Let's go, doggies. Hey, Mickey. Please welcome Mickey Drexler, winner of this year's Founders Award. Thank you, David, for your very kind words, and I want to thank the CFDA for this extraordinary honor and recognition. I'm really humbled and grateful to receive this award, uh, and I would like to thank my loving wife, Peggy, who was somewhere out there, who's been a wonderful partner to me for over the many years throughout my career. It's been, yeah, let's move to California, left Ann Taylor on Friday, move to Gap on Sunday, uh, let's move back to New York, left Gap, moved to J. Crew, uh, and uh, couldn't have done this without her, so for that I appreciate this. There's also my 90-year-old Aunt Rose who's here. She's sitting somewhere there. Uh, when my mother died, when my mother Mary died when I was a kid, and she's an important person in my life and still is, uh, uh, when I was a kid I got three new Jewish mothers, Rose and her sisters and my aunts Frances and Eleanor. So along with my wife Peggy and son Alex, who's here, our daughter Catherine, who's uh, away at college, this is her last year, and she has uh, her last classes tomorrow, so she couldn't uh, be here to join us. So, uh, but she spoke to me today, which is always nice to receive a call from your daughter at college, which is not an often time thing. <laughs> As a kid from the Bronx, and we, I know we mention the Bronx a lot, but it's in my DNA, I never pictured that I'd be standing on this stage. But I always had a dream and a vision uh, that at the time, and I didn't know what it was, but I knew that there was something more than what my life experience was giving me at the time. I always, every day, wanted to be someplace else. And there's nothing wrong with the Bronx, but I didn't want to be in my environment. Uh, it was the Bronx High School of Science that inspired me to believe I was as smart as the other kids there and changed my life in that it was automatic that one went to college when they graduated. By the way, in spite of the school's name, I was terrible in science, couldn't stand my chemistry teacher, and barely passed. Now, Steve Borkin, who was an old friend of mine who was playing the ball, is here, and we both, I think, didn't like Miss Frank, along with a lot of other teachers. Uh, but I excelled in math, and math is really important in business. I always tell that. After I finished school, my first job was at Bloomingdale's, and uh, I was saying to Margaret Hayes today, that led me to the late Katie Murphy. And a lot of you don't know who Katie was, but she was a fashion director at the time at Bloomingdale's, and I was lucky to work alongside of her. Uh, we traveled the world buying the goods. In fact, when I came back from my honeymoon with Peggy, Katie and I went off to Europe for three weeks, and we did it every three or four months. Uh, so she taught me how to look at things and see them. It was kind of natural. It wasn't like, this is the lesson and this is what you do and this is the markup. It's buy the best things in the world. And I was 23 years old, so who knew but buying the best things, not in the world, but things that sell, things that turn you on. We'd sit there in the Italian knit mill factories, buy great colors, and, uh, and we just had a great time. I connected the docks backwards and realized what a difference she made in my life and my career. Unfortunately, she passed away at a relatively young age. Uh, today, one might call her a mentor. It's a popular word, everyone's a mentor, but I knew her just as a great friend and a teacher. Uh, lastly, uh, I find there's no formula to success, and I don't think you can teach someone how to be successful. 
I speak to a fair amount of students, MBAs, whatever, college seniors, and uh, they're always saying, how do I get to do what you do? And I do tell them that most of you will never get to do what I do or others who are fortunate enough to do, because it's just not the way the numbers work in, in the world. Uh, but for me, these are the things that helped me along the way. I always worked hard at every job I ever had, even when it was folding towels for my uncle, Harold, my first boss, who was married to Rose, he's 91, and he's here with Aunt Rose uh, tonight. I did this job in my grandparents' basement of their two-family home on Wallace Avenue in the Bronx. I felt then the same way I do now, that I was really never satisfied and the job was never done. I was curious and lived in my imagination, not accepting the status quo. I never thought that good grades or high SAT scores meant you were doing well. That was so inside of me in not thinking that, but when you're especially at the High School of Science and the kid next to you, Philip Heller, he was always, I don't know, Steve, if you remember Philip, no matter what he did, he'd sit down and he'd get an A. And he was a quiet, nice kid, I think, but he never said a word. And it was so intimidating that he would get an A and he'd get an A, and I said, Philip, did you study hard? Mm -hmm. You know, he wouldn't really answer. So, uh, but, but I realized that after developing experience and wisdom that uh, later in my life, uh, there, uh, it really wasn't the case about uh, uh, success related to grades. And I say that today when I speak to a lot of students. Uh, you know, and, and in certain, you know, clearly you want your surgeon to learn how to operate, you know, and get good grades in school or your dentist or whoever else. But in our business, and in any business where there's a gut, there's an experience that connects. But in my opinion, there should be tests. And when I interview people, I'm looking for the other tests I take during interviews, emotional IQ tests, fire in the belly tests, and high energy tests. And that's really, and a drive. And of course, you want smart people. Uh, I always questioned authority and or titles, which sometimes got me into trouble and still does. And I've really learned and connected a lot of dots right now in terms of all those people who I grew up with or admired so-called because they had a title or they were the mayor or they were this and that. They're just like the rest of us. The uh, bell curve of there's great, there's average, there's not so great. And it takes time and I think that should be taught in school or in college or whatever. Uh, lastly, I don't let others be the judge of who I am. The more I get knocked down, uh, I get right back up. I find that adversity has been good for me, uh, and you need to know how to deal and roll with it. Learning that what I think about things or people is usually so, so trust your instinct and your judgment. Again, it takes time to do that. I've also, most importantly, been very fortunate to work with some of the most smart, creative, and talented people in the world, and for that, I am ever so grateful. And I always remember where I came from every day of my life. Thank you all very much.